Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're continuing our series dealing with financial planning for business owners. And we're on to uh, video number uh, 28. We're going to introduce the concept of buy sells here. Uh, we're going to deal with some simpler buy sell arrangements. And then the next uh, five videos, we'll get into more complicated uh, buy sell. So you can kind of see here that there are six videos that are specific to buy sells, videos uh, 28 through to uh, 33 inclusive. And this video serves as the introduction to those next five. So if you're going through the next five videos and you're confused about a concept, it might be worth coming back and rewatching this video. Okay. So a buy-sell is kind of like a prenuptial agreement for your business. Basically, you got everybody gets together, they start a business together, they say, hey, we know that right now we get along great, but we might not get along great forever and ever. So what happens if things change down the road? And really the two big questions here are, who would own the business and what price would they have to pay to the others to effectively buy those others out or that other person out. And we want to establish this when everybody gets along. If you wait until something has gone wrong, you'll see in this uh, presentation that this is where somebody is going to get most likely a bad deal. It would be very unusual that you get a fair deal when something has already gone wrong and we haven't really thought about it in advance. Some of the things that we can see go wrong then would be the death, disability, serious illness of a partner. And I would suggest that those are the places or a shareholder, partner, shareholder, whatever it happens to be, our business owner, those are the places where the death, disability, and serious illness, where we really tend to see most of this conversation focus a little bit on disagreement and retirement, but especially because I'm used to dealing with people who come at this from an insurance background, it tends to be the sort of insurance discussion here. And that's great. That's a good way to talk about the risks that can come up here, but those are not the only risks we should be looking at. You'll see here a much broader set of risks dealing with some insurable events, but also some non-insurable events. So if you're in business with somebody and we see these things go wrong, let's say, that, that uh, your fellow shareholder, you're maybe 50-50 in a business with somebody, and we see that, that person develops a serious illness, and that illness is bad enough that that person can't continue in the business, well now we want to know when is it time to buy that person out, what's a price to buy them out at, what are the mechanisms behind that purchase, all those issues are potentially quite difficult to deal with, and I would suggest you don't want to be dealing with those when that person has something go wrong. We want to deal with that early when everybody gets along, when we have the opportunity to discuss this without feeling like we are either taking advantage of somebody or being taken advantage of. The uh, other scenarios we see, uh, disagreement. So you have two shareholders here, two partners, and they just can't get along anymore. We might want a clause in our buy-sell agreement that establishes then what to do in that case. Or retirement, what happens when it's time for one of them to move on. Or personal bankruptcy, well in a case of a personal bankruptcy, you will have to typically uh, sell your assets or you're gonna have your assets seized by the trustee in bankruptcy and they'll sell them. Well, if I'm in partnership with somebody who has their shares in my business seized, now I might end up with a bunch of new partners in my business that I didn't intend to have. It would be better if I had the opportunity to buy that person out in some sort of a structured arrangement. You can have a divorce or separation here. I'm actually going to go through that example on the next slide, we'll leave that for now. You might have a morals clause. If you end up in business with somebody and they show up on the news behind an anchor person or whatever, as we've seen a few times lately, yelling obscenities. If you're in the public eye, you might not want to be in business with that person anymore. You might want a morals clause to deal with that type of issue. 
uh, failure to perform? What if you're in partnership with somebody and they just stop coming to work? Uh, loss of professional status. Again, you're in business with somebody and both of you are, let's say, selling investments and one of you loses your investment license well, that person probably is not the best person to keep around. And in some situations, they may not even be allowed to continue to be a shareholder of your business. Uh, change of tax residency. Uh, many provisions in the Income Tax Act rely on a business being a Canadian controlled private corporation. We saw some of that way back in the very, very early videos that we watched dealing with taxation of a corporation. If I'm in a 50-50 shareholder situation and the other shareholder, for whatever reason, becomes a resident of the United States, for example, now our business is no longer a Canadian-controlled private corporation and we lose access to many of our tax benefits. For example, the small business deduction is probably then unavailable. Uh, lifetime capital gains exemption may be unavailable to me now because of something my uh, fellow shareholder did, that can be a little bit awkward. <clears throat> and if somebody's uh, convicted of a crime, what happens if, especially a financial crime, if somebody who's convicted of embezzlement or uh, bribery or theft, something like that, you probably don't want to be in business with that person anymore. So let's have a look at our uh, separation example here. And I've gone, I've got uh, Amanda here. Again, we've uh, long ago carved out Darren. Darren's way out of the picture. Don't worry about him anymore. But uh, I've got Amanda and Alan. And unfortunately, Amanda and Alan are going to go through a separation. And this would be fairly common where we have a fairly significant asset over here. Alan's got about $2 million of shares of Trashco that he owns. And everything else that he and Amanda own together is worth $800,000. Left to chance here, or left without any sort of prior arrangement, that's $2,800,000 of stuff. And got to carve that up. Well, we got to now have $1.4 million go to each of them, assuming that they both have equal rights to everything in the business, which isn't always the case, but that is typically what happens. And even though business assets normally aren't divisible at law, the common law normally, or at the statute law, sorry, the common law normally does bring business assets in this picture. There's old Supreme Court of Canada case called Biblo that establishes that business assets quite often are divisible. So that really means 1.4 million has to go each way. This, if Alan takes none of the household assets, this still leaves Amanda with about a $600,000 interest in Trash Co. And we have to figure out some way to make that work. And if Amanda here is willing to maybe play a little bit of hardball, she might put herself in a position of not being willing to divest herself of those shares. What would be preferable here, I'm sure, what Bruce and Connie would prefer, is if there were some sort of structured agreement in place that said, if Alan is going through a separation and has to somehow divest, of himself, so divest himself of some shares, or if he can't otherwise meet his obligations, under a matrimonial support agreement, then there's some sort of structure in place for Bruce and Connie to buy out Alan's shares, something like that, before they get into this mix. And we can do this in advance, we can do this at a predetermined price. There's all kinds of things we can do here to facilitate a better deal than waiting for Amanda to wander into $600,000 of shares and then have to negotiate with her from that position. That's going to be difficult for Trash Co. It might be difficult for Amanda. It's almost certainly going to be a challenge for Alan. Just not where we want to end up. We'd rather have a prearranged deal. And this doesn't have to be unfair to Amanda. It can be perfectly fair for Amanda. It's just a matter of making sure that we know what this looks like in advance.
So what we normally see, absent any other sort of arrangement, is what's called the shotgun provision. And sorry, my end got cut off there by uh, Bonnie's head, but. Uh, Anyways, the shotgun provision, and that's where, this is the, the sort of default arrangement. This is what happens when we're left to our own devices in a buy-sell. If you don't engage a, a good lawyer to do a better buy-sell or whatever the case is, then you're gonna end up in a shotgun provision or a shotgun clause. And here's how a shotgun would work. Let's say that uh, Bruce unfortunately has something go wrong. We won't kill him, but let's say Bruce has a serious accident. And ends up comatose as a result. Now he's thought about a power of attorney and Bonnie, as it happens, is that's uh, Bruce's spouse. That's also Bruce's power of attorney. So she has power of attorney now over Bruce's stuff. And Bruce stops showing up to work now. That's not a surprise or anything like that. Alan and Connie know what's happening here. And it takes quite some time, maybe a couple of years later. Finally, Connie and Alan say, oh, this is too much. And maybe one of them triggers the agreement here. So uh, we might see something like this, where Connie says, okay, it's time to uh, get uh, Bruce out of here. He's not contributing to the business anymore. I just want to get him gone. And Connie now looks at this and says, well, I figure Bruce's shares are worth about $2 million. But I can't come up with $2 million. In fact, I really just have it as a priority to get Bruce gone. I assume that, and this is Connie's position here, Connie says, I assume that Bruce took care of Bonnie prior to this, all that good stuff. So really, I don't have to worry too much about whether Bonnie's well taken care of. And under a shotgun clause, here's what's gonna happen. Connie figures out a price. And she makes that offer. So let's say for the sake of argument, she offers, let's say $400,000, just for the sake of argument, to Bonnie for Bruce's shares. And it really is going to be Bonnie as the power of attorney here who's making the decision. Now we know those shares are worth about $2 million. Bonnie might even know that. The question here is can Bonnie come up with $400,000? If she can, she can actually buy Connie out of that price. Now does she want to do that? Who knows whether she does or not. Maybe Alan lends her the money. This is where we get into a little bit of a game of liars poker here. If Bonnie doesn't take the deal, if Bonnie doesn't agree to buy for $400,000, then we're going to have Connie buy Bonnie out. So we can see how this can backfire a little bit. This really becomes like a game of chicken or a liar's poker where Connie's trying to figure out the lowest price that she can afford that Bonnie won't be able to pay. Alan might get into the mix here. This can be very difficult. And there are some anecdotal examples, anecdotal evidence of real life businesses where this exact thing has gone terribly awry and left somebody in Bonnie and or Bruce's position really in a very difficult spot. Probably not what we want. And that's the intent of the buy sell is to get us around that. Okay, so what do we actually want to address in the buy sell? Well, it should talk about triggering events. What would happen, what would go wrong that would need or that would require us to use the buy sell? What about a share purchase mechanism? When do shares get bought? What tool gets used to execute the purchase? How do they change hands? What about money? Where does the money come from? If it happens to be death, disability, or serious illness, those are all insurable events. And if we happen to have insurance in place, that works well. But many of the other events that I showed on that list, just pop back there for a second, many of these other events would not have a 
pool of dollars magically available, and now we have to figure out where the money's going to come from. The divorce scenario I just showed, or separation scenario I just showed, would have that problem. Do we borrow the money from the business? Can we take out a loan from a third party? That's going to be very challenging. Good luck finding somebody to lend you money when you have a business where one of the shareholders, especially somebody who's key to the business, is in a position where they're exiting unexpectedly. What's very common in these arrangements is to have a vendor funded type of deal. Vendor funded means that we're basically going to give the buyer time to make that purchase. That would be a promissory note or vendor funded deal. It just means that effectively by giving time to make the purchase, the person who's selling is actually financing the arrangement. What about taxes? What happens with capital dividend account credits? Are we using taxable or non-taxable money out of the corporation to make these purchases? What about valuation? How do we arrive at a valuation? Is it going to be a fixed formula? Is it going to be based on some sort of mechanism that we put in place to determine it at the time of the purchase? Is it going to be just a set amount, a set value, no matter what? How are we going to do this? And any of these can have pros and cons. For example, if we're trying to ensure an arrangement, you almost certainly want to use a set value. If you insure and then use a formula, it could very easily happen that the amount of insurance does not match up to the need. So we like set value no matter what for insurance purposes, but that can seem very unfair if the value of the business has either fallen or risen since the agreement was originally entered into. And then a dispute resolution. If we can't get along, if there's some clause that we can't figure out in the agreement, we may have to employ a dispute resolution mechanism. We want to know what that mechanism is going to be. Do we go hire a mediator? Is there some other tool that we're going to use here? If we do hire a mediator who pays for that mediator, how much authority would that mediator have? Could we have a binding outcome here? Does it have to be by some sort of consensus? Again, this can be quite challenging. Now, I'll show you a nice easy buy-sell. This is the cross-purchase or crisscross, and this is the simplest one. It's not necessarily used all that often, but if you're going to actually structure a buy-sell, at least this gives us a starting point for seeing how this kind of thing works. So in a simple cross-purchase or crisscross, we're going to have Alan with $2 million of life insurance on each of uh, Bruce and Connie. And then Bruce is going to own $2 million of life insurance on each of Alan and Connie. And probably have this figured out now. Connie is going to own $2 million of life insurance on each of Alan and Bruce. Ah, Alan and Bruce, sorry about that. Okay. And now, if something happens to one of them, how about Connie? If Connie dies, and now each of Alan and Bruce receive $2 million of life insurance death benefit. They'll get that tax-free. It's paid to them personally. Now, Connie is going to have a deemed disposition. Her terminal tax return is going to show a deemed disposition for her. Oh, sorry. That's a million dollars each. I apologize. I did those all at uh, 2 million. Those should be 1 million. I'll fix that right away. Uh, terminal tax return. We're going to have a a deemed disposition here. She's going to have a $2 million capital gain. And then her estate will inherit those shares with an ACD of $2 million. And we'll talk more later on about what happens if there's a spouse in the mix or whatever the case is, but assume Connie just dies and leaves this to her estate. 
picture is all disposed, we're good to go. And let's just go back to here and fix my twos, make those twos into ones. I'm sure some of you were wondering as I was going through that. Okay, good to go. And now we're simply going to have each of Alan and Bruce pays $1 million to Connie's estate. That's a total of $2 million uh, to buy her shares. And now they each own 50% of business. And each has a $1 million ACB because they each wrote checks for a million dollars and owns half of a $6 million business. We haven't changed the value of the business by doing this. That insurance money was all just flowed into their hands. Nothing changed as far as Trashco itself. All right, I know that's a little bit of a long video, but that's our introduction to the buy-sell. I hope that helps to understand how that works. I hope it sets a foundation for the next five videos, all of which will deal with the buy-sell in more detail. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This video, number uh, 30 in the series, we're going to, sorry, number 29 in the series, I apologize. I don't want to do the videos out of sequence. Number 29 in the series, this continues our discussion around buy cells. And here we're going to delve into a fairly complicated buy sell. Unfortunately, um, this one, we just can't get around complexity with it. And you may want to pop back and review video 27, dealing with the stop loss rules. If those aren't, aren't uh, fresh here, then this video is going to leave you a little bit lost. So it may be worth a quick review of 27 before you uh, dip in here. Okay, the uh, 50% method, what happens here is, um, this is what you're often going to see in a properly drafted buy-sell, where we've taken the steps that I discussed in the last video, and we've actually put in place a thorough, robust buy-sell that contemplates a number of circumstances. This would be probably your most common uh, tax method for making this purchase. In this case, we're gonna have the corporation own the insurance, which is nice for using our proper corporate after-tax dollars then. A lot cheaper than owning insurance personally. Uh, the funds here are going to be paid to the corporation. We're gonna have the corporation redeem the shares then of the departing shareholder. And we're going to go through the mechanics of this on the next slide. And that's going to leave the remaining shareholders then who haven't actually spent any money with a higher proportion of ownership, uh, it sort of becomes like a tontine here where that first person to leave uh, leaves the remainder with a larger share of ownership. And as you'll see on the next slide, the tax outcomes here are fairly complicated. Okay, so we're going to look at 50% solution with stop loss. Now the stop loss rules, as I mentioned previously, will apply if there's no uh, grandfathering. And in the next video, we'll look at a grandfathered arrangement, which would be quite rare. We'll look here at the more common non-grandfathered arrangement. Okay, uh, let's, for starters, put some insurance in place. So in this particular case, uh, Trashco owns uh, $2 million of life insurance on each shareholder. And I don't really care how we do this here. Um, term insurance if they're younger, permanent insurance if we have a what looks like a more permanent need, not something to get too uh, wrapped up around here. Uh, certainly putting the right insurance in place makes a big difference, but we don't have the stage laid for that portion. So let's just deal with $2 million of life insurance. And uh, for the sake of argument here, we'll have Alan die. And when Alan dies, then we have a uh, $2 million death benefit paid to Trashco, 
And that brings with it a $2 million CDA credit. And this is one of the shortcomings I find sometimes of um, learning these methods is we always deal with life insurance here. And life insurance, of course, has the CDA credit, but you do have to recognize the possibility that when you're dealing with some other kind of buyout, and if you're dealing with some other kind of buyout, then you're not going to have CDA credit available. So we have this uh, $2 million CDA credit, and that assumes a zero ACB for the life insurance policy, of course. If there's an ACB for the life insurance policy, then that also will reduce the uh, CDA credits. Okay, so lots to think about there. We can't just assume that we're sort of uh, strolling through this cleanly. We have to make sure that we've considered whether all of this is actually true. Now, we're going to look at Allen's terminal tax return. And first off, on Allen's terminal tax return, now let's assume he has a zero ACB for his shares in the business. And we'll assume that for all three of them, in fact. Okay, and so Allen's uh, terminal tax return here, we're going to see. A disposition on death and with that disposition he's going to have a two million dollar capital gain. Now some of that may be offset with the lifetime capital gains exemption. If it is great um, but it's not necessary here we're going to see that this uh, solution works reasonably well in either case. So we go through this disposition and that means that his estate now inherits the shares and his estate inherits the shares with the tax paid they'll have a two million dollar acb now for the estate to use okay now we're going to come back to allen's estate in a couple of minutes but let's look at actually getting the shares dealt with so now um trash co will redeem allen's estate's shares And this is probably the most complicated part of this. What you have to recognize here is that Allen's estate is a shareholder. Trashco is paying a shareholder some money. There's really only one way that a corporation can pay funds to its shareholder, and that's through a dividend. So it's going to pay a $2 million dividend to Allen's estate to redeem these shares. And when it pays that $2 million dividend to Allen's estate, now what we have to figure out is what kind of dividend is that? So some of it will be a capital dividend and some of it will be a taxable dividend. Now we're dealing with the 50% solution here. The 50% solution says as long as the tax-free amount, the capital dividend, isn't more than 50% of the capital loss that we want to carry back, which I'll talk about more in a moment, then we're going to be okay. So we're going to pay a $1 million capital dividend here and a $1 million taxable dividend. I'll just point out real quickly that that $1 million taxable dividend, depending on your tax rate, depending on the province, that's going to be about $400,000 of tax payable, give or take. But Call it somewhere close to 400, might be 360, 370, 400, 410, 420, somewhere in that range, depending on the exact circumstances. But let's deal, let's just say around $400,000 of tax payable. And then that means that's actually going to be less. We can see already that that's less than it would be if we just had the full disposition with the capital gain. If we paid tax on the full capital gain, that would be uh, 2 million times 50% times, call it a 50% tax bracket, that would be about $500,000 of tax payable. So this does result in a lower tax bill than if we had the capital gain on the terminal tax return. Now, this $2 million is paid to Allen's estate. This is where this gets a little bit complicated because when the estate then disposes of its shares, it's going to have proceeds of disposition 
minus the ACV, of course, that gives us the capital gain. Now, what's a little bit unusual here, what we maybe aren't familiar with, is that we actually have to go and figure out what the deemed proceeds are. Okay, our deemed proceeds would be, take, uh, sorry, $2 million. We'll do this right from the beginning, I apologize. So our deemed proceeds will be uh, dividends paid to Allen's estate minus the amount paid. Okay, so out of the amount paid, $2 million is dividends, and the amount paid is $2 million. So you can pull out your calculator here if you need, but 2 million minus 2 million, I think you can trust me here, is zero. And this is a fairly complex provision in the Income Tax Act, but what it's designed to do is to prevent a double taxation from arising. If we didn't have this provision, then we would have tax payable on both the dividend paid to the estate and the dividend, sorry, uh, tax payable both on the disposition to the estate and on the dividend paid to the estate. So we can wrap this up at proceeds of zero minus an ACB of two million. That's going to give us a $2 million capital loss. As long as this all gets done within the first year after death, then we can take that $2 million capital loss and carry that back, apply that against the capital gain here, effectively wiping out the capital gain. You may also have a lifetime capital gains exemption available using the capital loss. Doesn't mean you have to use it against this capital gain. Remember, it can be used against any loss on that terminal tax, or sorry, any gain on that terminal tax return. So we could use it elsewhere too, even if the lifetime capital gains exemption exemption is available, we can double up here. So this is quite attractive because this means no tax payable on the disposition in the estate. And that's true as long as stop loss doesn't apply. And stop loss doesn't apply because the amount we're carrying back here is 2 million. The amount of capital dividend is only 1 million. 1 million is 50% or less than 2 million. And the uh, end result for uh, Bruce and Connie, where Bruce and Connie end up here, is that they now each own 50% of Trash Co. Allen's shares just got bought out. We had them with 100 shares each before. And they still have 100 shares. And at the end of all of this, there is nothing uh, that they have to worry about. Now, they do still have an unused $1 million CDA credit. Remember, we only used $1 million of that CDA credit, paid a $1 million capital dividend, still leaves us with that uh, generous CDA credit that's available. And they have no bump up to their ACB. Their ACBs are still zero or whatever they were when we started down this path. Okay, I hope that helps to understand the 50% uh, solution. I do find the best way to learn this is really to walk through it step by step and even to teach it. If you can actually take somebody else through it, that's how you'll understand it. It took me quite a while to get the hang of this and it is quite complicated. There's a lot here that's not necessarily intuitive. A couple of things that we don't see in any other place that we really have to get used to applying here. So I hope that helps. I hope it's uh, clear enough and I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're continuing our series dealing with financial planning for business owners. We are on the 30th video in this series, dealing with the share redemption by sell, or we'll call the 100% method here. In the last video, we looked at the 50% method. This 100% method will almost never be available. And we can see why here, because first off, the place where it will actually make sense to use it would be if we either had insurance in force or a share purchase agreement 
prior to, that's been in force continuously and really unaltered since prior to April 26th of 1995. There are a few ways that we can make small changes, but basically anything where we didn't have both of these conditions in place for the past 2000, or sorry, 23 years, it currently being 2018, the stop loss rules would apply and it wouldn't make sense to do this. But if you've had everything in place for so long, then the stop loss rules won't apply. You get grandfathering on this uh, prior set of arrangements. And that's where the 100% method would make sense. That's what we're going to work through on the next slide, as much as that would not be typical. Now, it could happen that even in light of the stop loss rules, the shareholders choose the 100% method. However, this is probably not a logical thing to do the tax on the 50% method is almost always going to be less than the non-grandfathered 100% method. And that's what we worked through last time. We worked through the 50% method in a non-grandfathered situation. In that case, we had a choice between paying tax on a $2 million capital gain, which would have been about a half million dollar tax bill. And that's what we would call the 100% method. It just wouldn't make sense to do it there. Or what we did do was we chose to have a $1 million taxable dividend. And you'll recall the other half of the dividend was a tax-free capital dividend with only tax payable on that million dollars that keeps that tax burden down to $400,000. That's why we did that 50% method where 50% of the dividend was capital and 50% was taxable. Now let's work through an example here with a 100% solution. So first thing is, and this would not be, and I think we can all agree on this, all that common, that everything has been in force since prior to April 26th of 1995. And it doesn't necessarily have to be everything. It would either have to be the um, share purchase agreement or the insurance, but really at this point, that's a probably a moot distinction in most cases. Let's say that's what's happened though. And now what we would do is let's have uh, the company, so Trashco owns uh, $2 million of life insurance on each of the uh, shareholders. And we'll have uh, Alan die here, sorry, Alan. And when Alan dies on his terminal tax return, again, it's an important distinction to make, on his terminal tax return, we're going to have a, a $2 million uh, capital gain that's based on his owning a third of the shares of Trashco. And that means that his estate then will inherit the shares with a $2 million ACB. And of course, we'll assume here that he had a zero ACB when he died, which is how we get to that $2 million capital gain. And now the estate's got that nice big healthy ACB. And now, We have a Trash Co. with $2 million, the death benefit from Allen's policy, and a $2 million uh, CDA credit. Again, assuming a zero ACB for the policy. If there was an ACB for the policy, then that CDA credit would be less. But let's assume here it's just simple term insurance and there's no ACB although hopefully they haven't actually been paying premiums on term policies for 23 years. At some point, hopefully a conversion would have happened there, but let's ignore that. And now, uh, Trash Co. pays a $2 million uh, capital dividend, tax-free, to Allen's estate to redeem those shares. And this time there's no stop loss applicable here. The 100% method will work.
and the estate then receives its $2 million tax-free. And just as we've seen previously, we would have to figure out the uh, proceeds of disposition. The proceeds will be the amount received minus any dividends. That's going to be $2 million. Received minus $2 million that's paid as a dividend. That gives us zero proceeds. And now we can plug that into our capital gains formula. We got proceeds of zero. We have an ACB of 2 million. That's going to give us a capital loss of 2 million, which we can then carry back and completely wipe out any capital gain on that terminal tax return. Again, that capital loss has to happen within the first year after death. As long as it does, we're okay. And at the end of this, we would then have uh, Bruce and Connie each still owning 100 shares of Trashco. Alan's shares have gone. So our end result here, Trashco is still worth $6 million. If you're following along, Trashco would have been briefly worth $8 million. It would have received that $2 million, but had to pay it out right away the share price actually doesn't change for Bruce and Connie for that purpose. Uh, the Income Tax Act actually allows that money essentially to flow through Trashco without changing the Income Tax Act valuation of Trashco. So that $2 million is essentially just a pass through. So Trashco is still worth $6 million. Bruce owns 100 shares. Connie owns 100 shares. And there are no other shares outstanding. And as previously, uh, no increase in their ACBs. Bruce and Connie uh, both have no ACB. And unlike in the 50% example, there's no CDA credit available to them either. That's our 100% solution. Again, not done all that often, but it is possible that you run into one of these scenarios. And it's good to understand at least because without understanding the 100% solution, I find the 50% solution is a little bit difficult. I hope you uh, learned something from that and I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you. Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. We're going to continue our series here dealing with financial planning for business owners. We're going to push on now to the promissory note by sell slide or uh, presentation 31. And this is one that I think it looks fairly common, but you'll find actually that the share redemption is the more common method. Although I'll show you where promissory note does, does get used in some real life scenarios. Now, first let's look at what a promissory note is. I think sometimes we take it for granted that people understand this. Basically it's a fancy word for an IOU. I write somebody a promissory note. It means that I'm going to pay them some amount of money at some point in the future. We would normally call that then redeeming the note when I actually pay off the debt. The big advantage is it allows a transaction to take place at fair market value without having to come up with cash. Basically the seller or vendor is lending the money to the buyer to make the purchase in question. Now this does create risk for the vendor and we'd often refer to this as a vendor funded arrangement. That is the person who's actually selling the property continues to uh, bear the risk. They've essentially loaned this person the money on a future promise to get paid. Legally, a promissory note is a negotiable instrument like a check. In theory, you could use this to pay somebody else for something, although that person is not obliged to accept it, just like they're not obliged to accept a check. So promissory note structures can have a whole bunch of different features. It could have interest attached to it, but in most sort of planning situations, we don't see interest attached. And the reason for it is because this tends to create some tax complications because interest is taxable, whether paid or payable. 
So if I have a promissory note that says it's going to recruit 10% interest every year, even if the uh, entity that issued the promissory note isn't actually paying me, I still have to pay tax on that 10% interest every year. And that means these are not necessarily ideal because there is often risk associated with these arrangements. For the party who has actually issued the promissory note, that interest is also deductible, whether it's paid or payable. Now, this uh, promissory note then could be redeemed on a schedule, could be called by the holder, could have just an indefinite period when it uh, would be redeemed. It depends on what we're trying to accomplish. That should be defined in the actual note. There are lots of financial planning uses for promissory notes, three common ones, and two of them here are pretty close to each other. But we see it sometimes used by a child to purchase assets from a parent at fair market value. Sometimes it's used by the purchaser of a business to create a vendor funded arrangement, although this does create risk for the vendor, as mentioned on the last slide, and sometimes used to make a purchase and defer payment until cash is available. That's what we're going to see here. Let's have a look then at a promissory note by sale. Now you'll notice here that I have a trash co at a smaller value than we've been using. I've normally been having trash co with a $6 million value, but here I'm going to assign only $3 million of value to trash co, and you'll see why in a moment. Okay, now let's say that uh, trash co, again, being perfect, uh, trash co has a million dollars of term life insurance on each of the founders. And we're going to, sorry, Connie, but uh, Connie dies here and we have a $1 million death benefit paid to Trash Co. And also a $1 million CDA credit, again, assuming the policy has a zero ACB. And then We're going to have uh, Connie's terminal tax return. And same as always here, we're going to have a $1 million capital gain. Now, one of the things that we normally see in the promissory note arrangement is the use of the lifetime capital gains exemption. Let's assume that it all qualifies here. Trashco is all active assets, which means Connie actually has a pretty small tax bill here. She's just going to have $150,000 capital gain when all is said and done, which would be $75,000 of taxable capital gain, which might result in maybe $20,000 or $30,000 of tax to pay off her terminal tax return. And now her estate becomes the shareholder of Trash Co. And it owns. Uh, sorry, it has a $1 million ACB for the shares that it holds. Okay, and now uh, Alan and Bruce want to buy out these shares. And what we're going to do is we want to get them into a position where they can take the capital dividend out of Trash Co. As of right now, though, there are three shareholders. We have Alan, Bruce, and Connie's estate as shareholders. Before we can access that capital dividend, we want to get the estate out of the picture. And this is where we're going to want to get some money paid out, but we don't have the cash in hand to do this yet. This is why we would use a promissory note. So now Alan and Bruce will each write a $500,000 promissory note to Connie's estate for its shares. And at this point, the estate is no longer a shareholder. Now, Alan and Bruce are each 50% shareholders of Trash Co. We've essentially knocked Connie and her estate out of the mix here. However, keep in mind, they do owe on his estate, a half million, sorry, $500,000. They each owe Connie's estate a half million dollars. And we've taken, like I said, 
Connie's estate right out of the mix here. And now Trashco has this million dollar CDA credit. It still has that million dollars on hand and now it's going to pay it out to its shareholders. It only owes that dividend to Allen and Bruce. And Allen and Bruce will get that money tax free. And now they have that cash and they use that cash to redeem the promissory notes held by Connie's estate. And we would have very little tax payable here when Connie's estate sells the shares to Allen and Bruce, we can see that it receives a million dollars of proceeds. None of those are dividends this time. We don't have that whole funny extra calculation we have to do here. Basically, we would just take proceeds of a million minus ACB, and that gives us the capital gain. Well, proceeds are a million, ACB is a million. We have no capital gain. At the end of this, Alan and Bruce actually have a little bit of an advantage that they did not have in the previous two scenarios. Alan and Bruce have used a half million dollars of their personal cash, money that was paid to them via that capital dividend account credit. And as such, they each have an ACB of $500,000 now. Now there's no unused CDA credits here. All the CDA credits have been accessed and used in this case. What really happened here that's different than the share redemption is that this time Allen and Bruce bought Connie's shares, whereas in the last two scenarios, Connie's shares were redeemed by Trashco. Okay, I hope that that makes sense. Now, there's one slight twist we can throw in here. And that is, let's say that now Trashco has $6 million of value. Well, what we liked in the last arrangement, keep in mind, in that promissory note structure, we got to use the lifetime capital gains exemption. Allen and Bruce got a bump to their ACB. The promissory note structure is good to the extent that there's a lifetime capital gains exemption available, but over that value, it does not make so much sense. Basically over whatever the lifetime capital gains exemption value is, it generally makes more sense. It's more tax efficient to use the 50% share redemption method. And that's what we're going to do here. What the buy sell would say is something like this. And there's variations on this obviously, but the buy sell is gonna say up to uh, the deceased shareholder, which in this case would be Connie, up to the deceased shareholders available lifetime capital gains exemption. And that would hinge of course on Trashco being a QSBC, but up to that amount, we're going to use the promissory note method. And then over that, over the available lifetime capital gains exemption, then we want to use the uh, share redemption method. You're really making a hybrid here where you would have both of these arrangements working hand in hand, you would basically have an $850,000 promissory note followed by $1.15 million of share redemption method.
for our combined two million or six million dollars of sorry two million dollars of value per shareholder based on a six million dollar valuation for Trashco. I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense. We looked at both the promissory note and the hybrid methods. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series dealing with business owners and financial planning for those owners still. We are now on to the uh, put call by sale. This is the 32nd video in this series. We're uh, rounding the corner to completion here. And I'll have another series coming after this. I actually just want to take a second here to uh, specifically thank uh, Peter O'Neill out in St. John. I know Peter as a group of consultants working through this video series with him. And I guess they're being subjected to these videos every Friday. No better way to spend your Friday than learning about uh, financial planning for business owners, I guess. So we're going to look at here, uh, put call by sale. This is a little bit of a I don't know, fancier solution. Depends how you look at it. Um, but let's say that with Trash Co, the three owners are all married and they're all married to people outside the business. Well, this actually opens the door to a planning opportunity. We know that each individual has a lifetime capital gains exemption. The problem though, is that we normally can't use the lifetime capital gains exemption for the business owner and for the spouse. If we could, that really opens the door to six different lifetime capital gains exemptions, we're currently at an $850,000 lifetime capital gains exemption or thereabouts. That really would take that figure times six. That's then about $5 million of capital gains that we could potentially exempt if we can use both spouses' lifetime capital gains exemptions. However, that's not normally going to be available. And the reason for that is because in order to use the lifetime capital gains exemption, the property that you are disposing of has to have vested indefeasibly with you. This is a kind of fancy word that you probably don't see in any other context, but really what vest indefeasibly means is that you're not compelled to sell that property to any other entity. And normally, because we're using a buy-sell agreement, you would in fact be compelled, that's exactly what the buy-sell does, you would be compelled to sell that to another person. So it's fine, the first to die, the spouse who's the owner of the business, they can absolutely use their lifetime capital gains exemption, but the second spouse, because of this vest indefeasibly problem, would not normally be able to use their lifetime capital gains exemption. Now, if you've got a couple and they're both in business together, and they're whatever 50 50 owners or something like that then yeah absolutely you can use lifetime capital gains exemption for both of them because they both owned shares that they could presumably sell to anybody else and even if the uh, sale of those shares is somewhat um, hampered by a buy sell agreement we generally are okay because the or sorry um, hampered by a unanimous shareholders agreement because the unanimous shareholders agreement is something that the group of shareholders entered into willingly. So I know that seems a little bit inconsistent, but the idea is the original shareholder subjected themselves to the USA where the inheritor of those shares, the second spouse here, did not subject themselves to the USA. This is an area that obviously has a little bit of legal complexity to it, but it's generally not a problem. Now, how are we going to solve this? How can we get that lifetime capital gains exemption multiplied? Well, instead of using the shareholder agreement, and this is kind of like something I described earlier, you may recall the session we did on insurance shares, and I had suggested in that session that it's possible to deal with some events by having specific features attached to the shares in question, rather than having a unanimous shareholders agreement that tries to capture all sorts of events. 
So to do this, what you might do here, and this is entirely going to lean on Melissa, our lawyer. She's going to be the one who's going to sort this out for us. Uh, Melissa's gonna help to draft the share structure so that each share says, hey, if certain events happen, similar to what we talked about before, those events where we would trigger the buy-sell event, okay, death, disability, maybe a bunch of other stuff too, as we saw earlier in the presentation. And if those events happen, then whoever owns the shares would be able to exercise an option. The uh, person who owns the shares, the surviving spouse, could compel the other shareholders to buy the shares in question at a set price. That would be called a call option. Or that person might be themselves compelled by the other shareholders to sell their shares. So the other shareholders can also compel. And basically what this means is that there will be one party, either the surviving spouse or the surviving shareholders, who triggers either their call option or their put option and buys out the other party. This gets us around that vesting indefeasibly problem because in theory at least, the surviving spouse could sell their shares to anybody at all. Okay, the uh, surviving spouse could sell their shares to anybody now practically it would be highly unlikely that anybody else would want to buy those shares because that call option or put option really significantly restricts the utility of those shares. Somebody else would buy the shares and they might think, well, I'm going to buy the shares at some discounted price or I'm gonna buy the shares that I'm going to demand a higher price from the other shareholders, but that won't be available because the put and call option creates such a, a structured set of outcomes. Let's have a quick look at how a put call solution would actually work in practice. Uh, we've got uh, now Connie here, Connie and her uh, spouse Chuck. And like I said, we need to lean on our tax professional and our legal professional here to have set this up and then to help us navigate these waters. So Connie, unfortunately, has died. Sorry, Connie. And on her death, What's going to happen here, her shares, which she's got 100 shares, are gonna have a $2 million value. And she will use her lifetime capital gains exemption at death, or her executor, more accurately, will use her lifetime capital gains exemption. And then these shares are gonna to pass to Chuck, and now Chuck owns the shares. He has 100 shares, and same deal now. He's got a $2 million value and about an $850,000 ACV based on Connie having used her lifetime capital gains exemption. And now, basically we're going to have Alan and Bruce use the conventional promissory notes or maybe insurance share arrangements, doesn't really matter for each of them. And the result there will be that each of them gets $2 million. Sorry, a million dollars, I apologize. Each gets a million dollars paid via the capital dividend account. So they have that money tax free. And now they're each going to use their million dollars. They're going to buy Chuck's shares. They're each going to fork out a million dollars here. For Bruce, so $2 million available. It's all tax free money to them. That $2 million is paid to Chuck, and Chuck will use his lifetime capital gains exemption. And it doesn't really matter if Alan and Bruce did this because they exercised their uh, call options or if this is done because Chuck exercised his put option, it's not really relevant. The point is that that money is going to flow one way or the other. That put call option really compels that to happen. What we're going to end up with here then is that Chuck exempts in total 
about $1,700,000 of capital gains, he only pays tax on a $300,000 capital gain, really a pretty small capital gain ultimately to pay tax on given the value of the transaction he just went through. It might, it might even actually be enough tax so that Chuck doesn't have to deal with any alternative minimum tax. And then uh, Alan and Bruce, at the end of this, they have paid no tax and they each own another, so they each own, it's gonna be now $3 million of shares of Trashco and each of them has a $1 million ACB based on them having used their after tax dollars to make that purchase. If you happen to have a business where you have shareholders, all of whom are in, let's say, happily married relationships with a good prospect of those relationships surviving a long time, then the put call buy sell can be quite useful and really reduce your taxes significantly. My concern with the put call buy sell, and I think you probably heard it in what I was just saying, is that what is the chances, what are the chances that Alan, Bruce and Connie all stay married to other people. You're really sort of assuming that the timing of the death of these folks is going to coincide with them being in happily married relationships. It could happen, but it's a lot to count on. That being said, still a useful strategy and definitely something worth understanding. I do see a lot of uh, tax professionals recommend the put call and really it allows us to double up on those tax benefits. We get to use CDA and lifetime capital gains exemption and keep our tax bill quite low. I hope that helps. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much.